Greetings and salutations, dear viewers, and welcome back to the realm of Final Fantasy XIV. Having completed Midas 1, we've paved the way for Midas 2, the Cuff of the Sun. As we did before, we're slowly making our way up Alexander's arm, attempting to make it to its core. Don't mind me, I just accidentally messed up my logs. In the meantime, Alexander. Midas II actually begins much the same as Gordian, Gordius II. And even still, I wouldn't say it's that much more difficult than Midas I. I'm disabling a couple of, st couple of cutscene notifications here, simply because I love the cutscene that introduces this one. I won't watch it every time, but... Much like Gordius 2, we start out with a long stretch with a bunch of random goblins in front of us that we need to take out. I generally focus down the gob walkers first, but for the most part, it's not that big a deal. They're all going to get grouped up together, and they're all going to be AoE'd down. I tend to focus on the Gobwalkers simply because they can take a bit more of a beating, so they'll generally be the last ones standing. With that done, you'll notice a grate on the side break open and a bunch of Maiden gliders fly in. These, similar to before, aren't actually that big a deal. We've encountered my, uh, gliders much like this before in Brave Fox's long stop hard, that I recall. They'll fly off randomly and attack somebody, but you can still keep them grouped up because they'll hop right back. And so we come to our boss. Is. I just love that intro. They're all going to be waiting on me, but I just love that intro. And for the sake of finishing this, I'll worry about fixing this later. So this fight is going to consist of four fights, really, and of the four, our first opponent is Blastoff. As you saw him do with the multiple clones of himself, his main mechanic is going to be creating clones of himself. Otherwise, at least for the moment, you can simply wear them down, don't stand in AoEs. You'll eventually see a marker over each person's head. Oh, don't stand in AoEs and don't step on bombs. You'll eventually see a marker over various people's heads. These you generally want to spread out a little bit for, just because it's harder to tell what's going on when they're all grouped together. You can see the marker there on several of us. On that person, a clone of Blastoff is going to show, uh, show up, and they're all going to point in seemingly a random direction, but perhaps it's uh, towards another player. But, and after a brief delay, they're going to shoot off in that direction, doing a decent amount of damage along the way. So you obviously want to try to stand where you're, none of them are looking directly at you. And then you can go just right back to beating down boss number one. Getting hit by one of those are going to give you a stack of vulnerability up, which, bad idea. 
Not only does it last a little while, but that also means if you get hit by multiple of them, you get more stacks, which means you're more likely to die to the dashes alone, much less the damage you'll take after that. But with the first down, our next opponent is Brawl. Now this guy actually gave me a little bit of confusion, but the big thing you're going to want to do is watch him, because he's going to float up in the air and change out his hand pieces. You see this very large pointy one that he's got on him? He's going to fire this at somebody, and it's going to do directional damage to anybody in the way of getting to that person. I have not seen a marker on somebody's head indicating who's going to get hit by it, so I have a very hard time telling which direction that thing is going to fly off in. And as I do here, I mistakenly think I should be fine standing next to him. No, don't. The next one you'll see is there will be a large circular cylindrical thing on one of his hands. He will then follow, or follow that up by shooting a very large laser out. This does a decent amount of damage to the tank, but really the tank alone should be taking it, and it shouldn't be that big a deal otherwise. Yeah, not getting hit by it that time. Maybe it does less damage the uh, further away from him you get. Who knows? Back to the one cannon, so again, the tank is going to be eating that one. Why did he turn so far to the side? I will never know. Why the tank decided to run that far to the side? I will never know. You know, if you've got an attack that can hit a bunch of people, just can you try not to point it at everybody? That'd be cool. And so, like, from here on out, I'm just super cautious about, like, no, I don't want to stand even remotely close. Now, when you see two cylinders on, on his hands, he's going to do a double laser. The double laser actually does spread damage, so you want the entire group to eat this. So everybody groups up behind him, the tank runs over, the double laser should ever hit everybody, and if it hits everybody, you shouldn't take that much damage from it. Oh, and he's doing it again. I'm surprised he didn't do it earlier in the fight, but perhaps this is something that he only does once he gets low on HP. just noticed somebody got locked out of the arena for that last one. I think they may have either accidentally hit return. I think that was it. Next up of the four is Swindle. You'll notice the arena is a little bit different from before, this time in a 4x4 grid of 16 total squares. These squares are going to play a very important mechanic later on in the fight, as you see some of them raise and some of them lower. I've got a status effect on me, you see the purple with the two different levels, it looks sort of like a down arrow, but I've got a purple effect on me. There is also a red effect. If you get a purple effect on you, you need to be standing on one of the platforms that's just a little bit lower. If you have the red one, you need to stand on the one that's a little bit higher. Easiest way to remember that one is red goes on red. You can see a red glow coming from the raised platforms. If you're not red, don't stand on red. He's got a couple other mechanics as well. We haven't seen the other one, I don't think yet, though he does have a couple or just raid-wide AoE. So I've got red this time, so I'm going to stand on the higher platform. Admittedly, I don't know what happens if you're not standing on the right platform. I've never actually not stood on the right platform. As um, 
raid-wide damage there, and then you see the large circle around Silken Coat there. You'll notice when the effect came up, there were two orbs floating around him. That means a total, and this includes the person that it's centered on, two people total need to be standing within that circle. If there are the two people in there, nobody takes any damage. If there's not two people in there, if there's one or three or five, it hurts. And last but not least, we're brought up to the final platform and Vortex. The last fight admittedly isn't that hard, but a lot of people have trouble um, figuring out that one circle with the orb circling around mechanic. Vortex, on the other hand, is a little bit harder. This fight is notably more complicated, and I suppose that goes to reason, considering he's the final match of the four. He's gonna put up more of a fight. Our final boss here deals predominantly with elements, so to say. So you'll see a couple things like this big water effect that comes around me right now, and I have a status effect on me of a little water droplet that's counting down from 15. When this timer runs out, uh, ignore me running around like a loon, when this timer runs out, a water spout will spawn where I'm standing. I want to place that near, but not at the boss. There's a good spot. You'll also notice there were the AoEs that put the large pain circles of molten goo on the ground. And then various people getting hit with an ice AoE that we saw there. Somebody with that ice AoE wants to hit the water spout that I made earlier with it. That creates, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, a large ice pillar. That's going to be important shortly. because he's going to use Ultra Flash, his most powerful attack. You need to block this by standing in way of the large ice. Cassie was not. For the most part, that's the fight, though. Electrical Jammer, I believe, is the one that puts the water effect on somebody, so we can see Scarlet now has it. So when the timer runs out, Scarlet's going to want to make sure that that water spout gets put somewhere important. We've got the large molten things coming down, and Super Cyclone, which is a knockback away from Vortex himself. The easiest way to handle Super Cyclone, so you're not just across the entire arena, is stand between him and the closest wall towards you, uh, to him. You should be pretty close to a wall if that the tank is tanking him near a wall. It, I'm pretty sure everybody wanted to kill me that time. So you see I'll run over here so the cyclone knocks me back just a couple feet and I can just keep wailing on him. The fight's not terribly complicated otherwise though. You're probably not going to be building up much of a limit break over the course of the fight. But as always, once he gets down low enough, do it anyway. Hide behind the ice for Alter Flash. As he's down to his final 16%. And that is effectively the final boss of Midas 2. I really enjoy this fight, not gonna lie. I like the four separate fights you have to do, and just the idea of these four parts of effectively a whole. Kinda hard to get to uh, dodge that Super Cyclone, but he should be dying soon anyway. We got off the level 1 limit break at some point, but it's not that big a deal. And with that, Midas 2 is completed! We can head on to the exit and head out. Um, as usual, you get the various drops from this that you got from... Gordius 2. The bolts plate, or bo bolts, pedals, and lens, I think? Yes, lens. You can get one item from Midas 2 per week. But that'll do it for today. Until next time, everyone.